assim. Bom, bom dia, bom dia a todos e a todas. É, então, sejam bem-vindos a mais um colóquio do IFISC. Hoje, é, só lembrando que esse colóquio ele é transmitido no YouTube. Então, para todos os, os ouvintes, né, o pessoal que está seguindo pelo YouTube, se vocês quiserem fazer perguntas a, pelo YouTube, fiquem à vontade. A gente, a, a gente acompanha no final a, do colóquio. A, a gente a gente passa as perguntas para o palestrante de hoje. Então, é, I will now switch to English. Uh, we now we have the pleasure of today of receiving Professor Wilfred van der Veel, uh, and I will give the microphone now to Professor Andrea, who will give a brief introduction of our speaker of today. So, thank you. So, good morning, everybody. It's a pleasure to be back. Some of you might know that I was away on a leave of absence for one year and a half, and this is the time when I had the opportunity to meet uh, Professor Van der Veel, because we were actually in the same uh, cooperation project. Uh, he actually comes from the University of Twente in the Netherlands. I was in Germany, but there is a large project in collaboration between uh, these two universities, and that's how we came uh, to meet and collaborate. So I will give you a brief introduction here to, uh, to his trajectory. He told me not to be too long, so I'll try to be short and precise. He got his master's in applied physics cum laude at the Delft University in the Netherlands in 1997, and he got his PhD in applied physics also cum laude at the same university in 2002. And then he took a three-year postdoc period uh, at the University of Tokyo in Japan. Then he came back to the Netherlands to become a project leader uh, at the University of Twente. And he became associate professor in 2007. Since 2009, he is a full professor at the University of Twente. And since the year 2018, he's the director for the Brain-Inspired Nanosystem Center. So basically his focus, his area of interest is nanoelectronics. He's interested in unconventional electronics for efficient information, information processing. He's a pioneer in materials learning in the nanoscale, realizing computational functionality and artificial intelligence uh, in designless nanomaterial substrates through principles analogous to machine learning. So he has authored more than 125 publications, more than 8,500 uh, citations. So welcome, Wilfred, floor is yours. Thank you very much, uh, Andrea. Not as uh, quick and painless as I had uh, requested, but still very nice and kind introduction. And also, thanks a lot for organizing this wonderful uh, visit of mine, my first visit to Kaunas, my first visit to Brazil. And uh, I'm already quite impressed uh, by what I'm seeing here and the nice campus and nice activities. So, uh, yeah, thanks also for you all, all being here. Um, I will be talking about this uh, topic of material learning, which may sound very strange to you, so I hope by the end of the talk I have given you a glance of what I mean, uh, me and my colleagues mean by, by this concept of material learning. Uh, and I will do this, of course, by illustrating part of our uh, own work. Um, so I understood it's supposed to be very interactive and, uh, and nice and lively, so please stop me, uh, raise your hand if you have any questions or comments or you really don't like to talk, there's an emergency exit here uh, where you're always free to go. Uh, yeah, so let's, let's uh, kick off, um, if I get this to work, yeah, with my most important slide of uh, this morning, and that is uh, acknowledging uh, the loads of people who were uh, involved in the work. And uh, I will not go through all the names, but I will really point out the people uh, at, at the place where I, I discuss their work. But it, it illustrates that uh, this is really an interdisciplinary effort. And my own background is in applied physics, but we collaborate with mathematicians, with electrical engineers, computer scientists, uh, 
um, and, uh, and so on. And uh, this makes for a very vibrant uh, research uh, environment, which I, I really enjoy uh, myself a lot. Okay, well, um, I came to tell you uh, that today is uh, the 23rd of, uh, of September. Uh, this is uh, a free piece of information uh, for you. So it's the uh, start uh, of our autumn in the Netherlands and uh, you have a nice spring ahead, which is nice. Um, but um, you could also turn this in a small math problem. And I heard you have this really renowned math and computing center here. So maybe some of the mathematicians among you feel free to solve this mathematical puzzle. Please don't use your iPhone too quickly. Okay. So, any volunteers? I heard you are kind of the creme de la creme of this uh, state, so please don't be shy. <laughs> I thought it was only uh, the, like en vogue in the Netherlands that you came up with this approximate answers. No, but uh, I'm still old school, so I want to have. Oh my God! Oh my God! <laughs> you guys are next level. Okay, so not so trivial, right? Anyway, I'll see you this week. 1990. It's good enough, right? Okay. But uh, we can go also really next level. You can also interpret today's date as a, a kind of division. Well, I won't bother you with this, but uh, this already starts to, to be a little bit more complicated, guys. About one. About, <laughs> about one. <laughs> well, about 10, I would say. Order of magnitude, acceptable uh, for physicists. OK, now I would really like you to uh, focus on the screen and, and, and pay attention. So maybe you saw for a split second a picture, a photograph. What did you guys see? Approximate answers are accepted. A man. Office, desk, man we got, yes? Sorry? Curly hair. Pink shirt, pink shirt. So we have a, a guy, curly guy. <laughs> okay. Well, let's have a look. There he is. Uh, yeah, curly. I think we can discuss about it. But it's uh, yeah, it's a guy. The the projector makes the blue shirt maybe a little bit pinkish. So I also find it's good. It, behind the desk, uh, also pretty accurate. Any idea who this guy is? Yeah, hardly changed at all, so it's not a hard one. This is uh, me uh, behind my desk in the cubicle in, uh, in Japan. So this was my first visit to Japan when I stayed there a couple of months. So the point I would like to make here is I'm not here to share holiday pictures with you or telling you today is September 23rd. I just would like to illustrate to you that solving even a super easy mathematical problem uh, is, is a kind of challenge. I mean, people are a bit reluctant. They're afraid maybe I make a mistake. Um, and so the answer is, uh, is, is not coming, coming up immediately. Whereas if I do this in really difficult experiment with you, because I, it's really 25 of 250 milliseconds or so that I flash this uh, picture, actually we get immediately response and we get quite accurate description. Eh? It's a guy behind the desk, and his hair is a bit curly. So the point I want to make is our brain is super good at some tasks and actually pretty bad at other ones. So uh, here you see kind of very rough comparison between uh, man-made information processor, computers, which are actually very good at this logical operations, at this, at this computation. So, of course, even a pocket calculator of 30 years ago, no problem whatsoever to, to do this uh, mathematical problems. Whereas our brain is not good at it, but it's very good at interpreting uh, the world around us and, and do uh, recognize patterns, recognize images, and so on. 
So if you try to make a further comparison and you, and you try to see, well, what, what are the typical amount of operations that are executed in a, in a processor, you find typically order 10 to the 11 or so operations per second. Whereas in, in, the, in the brain, it's a little bit tough comparison, but you, you can come up with something like 10 to the 15th. And it's not because our brain is so super fast. At least the individual components are actually very slow. The individual neurons are spiking typically uh, maybe with one 10 hertz or so. Um, but it's really the huge amount of, of neurons that we have and the interconnections that they have. All of them are, have, are connected maybe to 1,000 or even 10,000. So it's the huge parallelism that finally allows still that uh, there is a lot of operations going on per unit of time. Whereas uh, we as engineers have put a lot of effort over the last decades to make individual components faster and faster and faster. Yeah, so uh, the clock frequency of these processors is on the order of uh, gigahertz, right? Uh, whereas, again, uh, individual neurons, they, they are somewhere around hertz, 10 hertz. So there's a huge gap. Yeah, and the reason why we have made these individual components, transistors, process faster and faster is so that we could still do a lot of operations even if we work in a sequential scheme where we do one operation after the other. But there we basically are hitting the limit. And we can't go faster. Well, we may go faster, but then we start to heat up uh, our chip. We get problems with really uh, uh, the, the cooling of this uh, system. So the, already for many years, for a decade or so, there is really a ceiling on the, on the speed of um, of these uh, processors. And that is now a serious bottleneck of, uh, of, uh, of digital electronics, this, this, this heat, uh, heat production and, and power consumption in general. So you may ask yourself, how can it be that uh, our board computer, our brain, can do this amazing amount of operations with a power consumption of uh, just 20 watt, typically? Uh, whereas for, for these chips, there is, there's orders of magnitude uh, more energy necessary uh, per operation. And that has everything to do with the underlying architecture of the brain and also our digital computers. And so our digital computers are based on the fundamental ideas of Turing and later on worked out for, for electronic computers by von Neumann. And one of the main aspects of uh, the digital computer is that there is a physical separation between processing and memory. Yeah? And whereas in the brain, kind of, there is an overlay, there's a co-location of processing and memory in the neurons and especially in the plasticity of the synapses. So there's really processing and memory happening at the same place. In processors, uh, there's a lot of transport through a common bus of uh, of data all the time. And that's really the power uh, consumer uh, of the standard uh, digital von Neumann architecture. So based on fundamental differences in the architecture, you can already get an idea of why these two ways of processing information uh, are so different in terms of power consumption. So this, uh, although some things you can really uh, do better with a digital computer, like solving mathematical puzzles. If you are thinking about uh, interpreting the world around you, image process, uh, pattern recognition, machine learning kind of things, maybe it may uh, be a very good idea to have hardware that is much closer to the architecture of the brain. And that's why we are looking at this uh, brain-inspired nanosystems. Okay. So uh, the idea to, um, uh, to, to make uh, models based very loosely in a very abstract way on the brain are very old. Uh, this is already 50 or 60 years old maybe that people came up with the idea of a perceptron and of neural uh, networks. So just to give you a very uh, brief and rough introduction of what neural networks do because 
guess not all of you are really familiar with the concept of a neural network. The neural network is, is a mathematical model. It's in software, it's, it's, it's a mathematical description. It's a function that uh, can be built up of many of these nodes that we call artificial neurons. And here you see basically the, the basic concept we also call a perceptron. And what it does is that it collects inputs from neurons in the previous layer, so for example like this guy, and it weights these inputs by a weighting factor we call W, W1, 2, and so on. Then it's being summed, so this is a linear process, linear summation of these, uh, of these inputs, and then there is a nonlinear element, uh, what we call a threshold function, and once uh, the sum of all these inputs passes a certain threshold value that we can determine mathematically by bias, then it goes from zero to one or minus one to one, whatever function you take there. That's basically the basic building block. And what you can do now is when you have this meta structure of your neural network, you can start to train it. Yeah? Because that's the whole idea of neural networks. And this is a very specific example of supervised learning with feed forward, but it illustrates the idea. You, for example, have this problem of uh, recognizing and classifying these, these animals. What you do is you feed a lot of photographs of different animals to the input of your neural network, and you can do that, for example, in a pixelated way. And then you start to look at the end of your network whether the right bulb start burning. Yeah, if you feed a picture of a dog, you want to have uh, that the, the output for dog uh, gets high and the others are low, and so on for cat. And the trick now, and the magic, if you like, of these neural nets is that you find the accompanying weight factors that actually give this specific functionality. Yeah, so there are mathematical uh, algorithms like backpropagation, gradient descent, uh, specific uh, operations that help you to find the suitable weights, biases that finally result in uh, the neural network solving exactly this problem. So if you come with uh, a picture of, of a cat that the neural net has never seen, still it will be able with quite a high probability to give the right answer. And so the, the idea is very different from, from a program-based uh, solution where you really have a description line by line and where a priori basically all the intelligence is built in. Here you have a meta structure, you come with a rough skeleton of your neural net and then there is the process of machine learning that finally results in a set uh, of weights and biases that uh, correspond with the solution of this problem. But then it's very specific, right? So if you come now with a, a, a photo of an airplane of a car, then this guy is not able to, to solve it. But in principle, it should be able to generalize that if you come with a completely new picture of uh, the cat of your sister or so, then this neural net should be able to, to solve that problem. Is that clear? This kind of general idea of the neural net? No. Okay, well, there's been a lot of uh, work on, on this kind of uh, machine learning, and uh, this is uh, a, a nice summary which along the vertical axis basically uh, sa uh, states the amount of um, uh, operations that uh, has to be uh, be done, so it's kind of the computational effort, and along the horizontal axis we have time. And it starts with uh, very easy uh, models that uh, do image recognition, for example, and do some easy speech recognition, and uh, you see that there is really a change in the trend uh, of how this computational uh, effort uh, oh, the consumption or the amount of operations needed to train these systems uh, um, yeah, consumes, and that that's happens, well, this is roughly 10 years ago. You see that suddenly uh, the, uh, there is a doubling, not every roughly two years, but actually a doubling of the um, uh, amount of operations every three months. And uh, this seems to continue, and the interesting uh, comparison you can make 
is that this doubling of re required resources has more or less the same trend as Moore's law in these previous decades. And maybe you have heard about Moore's law, basically the doubling of, uh, of uh, the amount of transistors per area every 18 months or two years roughly. So the basically requirements and hardware are kind of in balance here. But here you see there is an enormous imbalance. So this power, uh, the accompanied power uh, requirements are basically exploding. And so we, we do see that hardware and, uh, and requirements for computation are completely uh, unbalanced already for uh, quite, quite some years. So this is a kind of a bell ringing that maybe we really should uh, not only looking at maybe making our algorithms for this machine learning uh, more economic, but also look at the underlying hardware, which is of course not so crazy because we are basically doing calculations, models that are inspired on the brain, but we do them on hardware that is very brain unlike. And so just philosophically, you would already say, well, wouldn't it make sense to do brain like kind of stuff on hardware that is also much more like the brain. Right. Well, here you see an example uh, which you probably have heard of. It's very, very famous now a couple of years ago where uh, this poor Korean guy had to play uh, the game of Go against uh, an uh, AlphaGo, a system made by uh, Google DeepMind. Uh, he has only one brain of uh, 20 watts. And uh, well, this system AlphaGo has behind, behind the curtain uh, nearly 2,000 CPUs and, uh, and nearly 300 graphic uh, processing units. So it's, it's, uh, it's consuming one, one megawatt. Uh, so when you hear that uh, this AlphaGo uh, won four out of five matches, it's very impressive. But uh, if you see the energy uh, label and also the energy tech uh, related to that, it all, of course starts to make you think if this really uh, is the way to go. Um, so you may have also seen that the projections for electricity consumption related to ICT are also uh, projected to be really exponentially growing, which has to do, of course, with things like, uh, well, the internet, obviously, data centers, but also the internet of things, things like self-driving cars, uh, smartphones, all these things contribute that maybe in 2030 already about uh, one-fifth of all electricity consumed is for, IC, for ICT. And uh, this is an example from my own country, the, the, the Netherlands, uh, where there is uh, uh, talk about making new data centers and, um, well, these new data centers consume more than twice the energy of the whole city of Amsterdam. And so every time when you do a Google search or you do a Siri or whatever, please think of that, that uh, there's not such a thing as a free lunch, right? It always comes with uh, an, uh, an energy footprint and therefore carbon as well, of course. Yeah, and well, maybe apart from this energy story, things can go still quite okay if you have these remote data centers and uh, you, you, you do your uh, inquiries in the, in the cloud, but if you really want to go in a, in a decentralized way, if you want to do computing to call, uh, at the edge, for example, for self-driving cars, it becomes really an uh, existential uh, problem, right? Because if you consume like more than half of your uh, battery capacity or more on, on calculating how this car should drive, that's really an issue. So, um, not only focus on algorithms, but also on hardware. That's the point I try to make in this intro. Right, okay. So, and that's basically what has been uh, happening in uh, quite some big companies already. Uh, IBM has come, come up with a brain-like chip. We call that brain-like also neuromorphic. You may have heard that, that term. So there's True North. Intel has come with chip uh, Loihi, it's also a neuromorphic chip. Uh, there is uh, Google with the tensor processing unit. There's Apple with a bionic chip. So 
all these big companies understand that yeah, you have to do something about the architecture of your chips. But most of these, basically all of them, are still based on the traditional building blocks being transistor, being silicon as the, as the main material. And so they, they may come up with a smarter way of, of arranging them, but fundamentally they are still based on, on, on switches, uh, transistors that are either zero or one. It's, it's based on digital uh, technology. And what I would like to talk about here is maybe we should go back to, to analog systems again, to systems that are not only representing uh, zeros and ones, but also grayscales in between, which comes with a price, but also will give you something. And as a basically substrate for that, I would like to introduce these complex materials and also the idea of um, material learning. Well, we are familiar with learning, I've introduced to you the very briefly, roughly, the idea of machine learning. So now, material learning. So the idea there is that we are not going to, to tune, and to massage a mathematical model, like a neural network model in software, but that we directly are going to manipulate a complex material system to make it functional, for fit for purpose, for a certain uh, for a certain task. And so we skip the model part and we try to work directly in the material. So if you um, would do that, yeah, you, you have to think, of course, a little bit about what kind of material would be suitable for doing this information processing uh, job for you. Yeah? So you could maybe take a stone out of your garden or a wooden club out of your garage. Maybe it's not the smartest idea to do. So. Uh, together with colleagues in Münster, we wrote this kind of perspective on what we could consider uh, intelligent matter. And that intelligent matter would be very, would be very suitable to, inf to do information processing with. So intelligence is a very difficult concept. It's even for, yeah, it's, it's very hard to define. So we came up with um, the idea that uh, intelligent matters, at least in the engineering perspective, should have these four elements of sensing capacity, actuation capacity, it should have uh, network and feedback properties, should have long-term memory, basically so that it could learn, that you have plasticity, so that your material can really change over time. Like your brain, hopefully after this talk, your brain has physically changed. You will have new newer, stronger connections and maybe you break some of them and maybe if you have a beer or two tonight a couple of your neurons are again are gone but it's no problem because the brain is plastic enough to to take care of that so also material could be like that and then non-linearity i added here also as a very important ingredient because it's basically a kind of decision making mechanism as uh, you also see in these neural network models, uh, this nonlinear function. So if you, if you accept, I mean, this is a proposal, I mean, there's nothing holy about it, but if you accept this kind of engineering-based definition of intelligence, then you could distinguish different classes of complexity. So structural material would be really deriving its functionality purely from its structure and shape, like, like a baseball uh, a club a bat or so. Um, you could then go an, one step higher uh, to responsive material. That would be material that can mm, get some input, some, some stimulus, uh, like a light stimulus, and respond to that by, for example, absorbing light and then, all, again, emit, emitting light. For example. So that's represented by these, by these lights here. Then, uh, this responsive material would always respond in the same way, but if you have adaptive material, then maybe depending on multiple stimuli and on the internal state of this, um, of this uh, material, you could have that the um, uh, response could, could be different, so not always, always the same, so it adapts, uh, but still uh, dependent on the here and the now, yeah? so depending on the present inputs, uh, the response could change. And then intelligent matter would really be able to also take into account experience from the past. So it would really have also this learning ability so that um, 
uh, all the, the response also depends on, on, on previous experiences and maybe it will really uh, adapt and learn um, that, uh, that response based on, on previous uh, inputs. So that would be then kind of the highest state what we could consider for doing this information processing with, uh, with Meta. Well, we know this, this kind of systems, of course, from, 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 the, from biology, from, from the living world, like this, this lack of an octopus, where a lot of uh, these things that I mentioned are really taking place locally. So a lot of the, the brain of the octopus is actually delocalized. It's in the arms, so you have this decentralized system. And now the big question is, can you really do similar stuff uh, with inanimate matter, with, with dead matter, yeah? or is biology so unique, is, is, is living system so unique uh, that you can only do the things that I described in, uh, in, with those systems. Well, that's a long introduction to, to get to the point where we, uh, where we started a couple of years ago uh, when we didn't have this kind of clear idea yet about what intelligent center and so on. But um, we had these ideas of could we indeed start from a disordered uh, nanoscale system and could we learn it in situ uh, to, to let it carry out certain tasks. And the proof of principle that we chose was Boolean logic, uh, Boolean logic gates. Not because it's so important to, to, to use our way to make Boolean logic, but purely as an illustration. And the material that we chose uh, was uh, nanoparticles, gold nanoparticles. So what you see here in this cartoon is a network of gold nanoparticles, which are like 20 nanometer in diameter. They have some uh, molecular shell around them to isolate them from each other. And the uh, gold stripes, they are electrodes, so we can apply inputs and outputs. And why we chose these uh, gold nanoparticles is because uh, at low temperature, so this is quite an academic experiment still, but at low temperature, these uh, gold nanoparticles behave as very Nonlinear system. So this nonlinearity that we really need for for decision making is built in because of uh, Coulomb charging. So here is a schematic of how a, a single nanoparticle works. You have this discrete potential uh, states. The difference between these different potential levels is given by the uh, charging energy. So these islands are so small, their capacitance is so small that for every additional single electron that you add you will have a measurable amount of energy called the charging energy, which is given first order as E squared over C. Normally you don't see that at, at high temperature. If you go really to low temperature, you will see that uh, you, you have this charging energy and only one electron can tunnel at a time. And this gives this very spiky uh, behavior that you can see here, current as a function of the position of these potential levels. So only if you position uh, potential level really in this bias window, you will measure uh, this peak. So you have a very spiky like behavior, which we understand very well on a, on a single particle level. But uh, we had, of course, no clue what would happen if you just throw tens or a few hundreds of those in, uh, in this network and uh, even less whether you could make, make something useful out of it like a Boolean logic game. So that was the, that was the challenge. And then, of course, the question is, yeah, how on earth can you get your system to do what you really uh, like to do? And then we go to one example of what I would call uh, material learning, uh, which is artificial evolution. Or some people call it evolution in matter, because we apply it here to a uh, material substrate. And um, this is an idea drawn also from the, from the model world. Um, but what you, what you see is here a kind of iteration where you take your material here in the physical domain as the central starting point. You apply physical inputs. In our case, that's, that would be voltages. You measure an output. We measure currents. And then you also change uh, the physical configuration, which we do by applying uh, additional voltages in the periphery of this network. So we don't believe that we really plastically change uh, our material system, but we change the potential landscape so that the currents that flow through this 
wild uh, collection of particles changes dependent on the uh, current, uh, the voltages, sorry, that we apply in the periphery. So we try just a, a couple of these physical configurations. We measure those, uh, the outputs, and then we go to an external computer, still it's an ex kind of external processor, where we compare the output from that material system with the desired output. So we do a kind of comparison and we assign a fitness to that or an error function. And so we compare basically, is the thing doing what we want it to do? And of course, when you start to do this trick, of course it doesn't do what you want to do because why, why would it do so? It's, it's random. But then you can start to, to play around it. This is where the artificial evolution element come in because you start to treat these different physical configurations, you start to treat them as, as different individuals, all with their own set of kind of genetic information, which in this case would correspond to the control voltages. And then you can do things like crossbreeding, you can start to introduce uh, mutations, you will have selection. So you play all these kind of abstract uh, games of, of genetics and, and sexual reproduction, you apply in the kind of numerical domain, and then you feed it back to the actual physical device, and you look whether this uh, output is, is, is actually more resembling what you, uh, what you desire. And yeah, then you have to iterate to a moment that um, the output is fit enough for purpose, eh? when you are happy that uh, the input-output relationship is, uh, is, is good, good enough. So to make this more concrete, let's go back to uh, our uh, physical device. So here you have again these nanoparticles. We have two inputs voltages. We have one current output, and we have a couple of control voltages around and also at the back. Then we apply these voltage pulses, so corresponding with uh, one, zero, one, zero for, for these two inputs, and we try to realize, yes, please, So, what do you mean by growing a network? Like, like also material? Uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, well, the, the, there, as I will argue, there are really many, many different ways that you, you could do and create such a disordered system where uh, there's maybe a slightly different correspondence to, to, to the actual nodes in your model and, and the physical system. But um, yeah, in principle, we, we chose to, to make this blob of particles, but you could also indeed go bottom up and, and grow, grow some percolative uh, system or so. Or you, we have also done experiments with uh, polyaniline, so like conducting polymers and things like that. So there's many systems that allow you to exploit so complex. Okay, dynamical is, is, is an important point because so far what I'll, I'll be discussing is, is there is no time dependence yet. But of course, you can also have a material system that exhibits this, this time dependence and dynamics and then you can uh, also uh, work on a completely different class of materials which, which, which are time dependent. So, so it's, it's kind of generic. Okay, so for, for this kind of uh, proof of principle toy problem, we wanted to realize different uh, logic gates where you see here the standard truth tables. And to keep our lives simple, we still work kind of in the digital domain that we only have zero and one input. But of course, this is not necessary. Yeah? But it's just to make our lives simple. So here you can see kind of representation that the uh, output here the actual output represented by these red dots is not really like the desired end output. The end output should be only high and, and logical one if both inputs are one. So you can see this here in the, in the truth table. So this is not there yet, but by uh, changing a little bit more the uh, control voltages, you uh, hope to arrive at a, uh, at a fitness that is, that is good enough for purpose. So that's the strategy, and uh, this is the result. Uh, here you can see that we are 
working at ridiculously low temperatures, 300 millikelvin, so it's super low, and it's only to be in this Coulomb blockade regime so that we can exploit this nonlinearity. Um, but the nice thing is that we can basically get all the logic uh, available for two inputs, one output. So we can, we can do things like the AND gate or also the exclusive OR, which I'll come back to in a moment, which is a, is a tough problem in general for also simple neural networks uh, consisting of a single layer of perceptrons, for example. So this gave us a, a first idea that, that this general approach works, yeah, that you can basically use a disordered system to, um, to get functionality out of it. But of course it's, uh, one second, I'll come to you. So of course it's, um, it's very impractical to work at these very low temperatures also with these gold nanoparticles. So that's why we moved to a, another material system, which I'll talk in a moment, but I'll come to you first here. What is the? The paper? The role. Yeah. Ah, okay. So the role is uh, setting the configuration. And so the role of V1, V2 is in this case the configuration. And so you apply a kind of a globally a voltage, but it will drop over all these different particles. So effectively, you will change the um, connection between the particles. So you could see uh, in an abstract way, it's a, it's a global way of changing the weights. And so if you want to, to map it on a neural network kind of model, then it would be manipulating the weights. Yeah, thank you. Okay. Yeah, so impractical. So we go to uh, another system. This is based on silicon and uh, dopant atoms inside. As you can see, the, the, the overall structure is very similar. We still have a central region of about 200 to 300 nanometer, eight electrodes around it also. But instead of nanoparticles, now we have uh, individual atoms uh, forming a disordered network. So we use boron, arsenic, or phosphorus or so. Um, and the interesting thing about this approach is that we also get very nonlinear electrical uh, behavior. So we are far away from the typical regime in which we operate field effect uh, transistors. And um, we can use very standard um, uh, yeah, uh, semiconductor device fabrication like etching and, uh, and also ion implantation to, to get those devices. And as a bonus, we also get this nonlinearity at much higher temperature. Much higher temperature means, in this case, uh, 77 Kelvin, which is still pretty cold, uh, but at least it's liquid nitrogen, and I'll, I'll show in a moment that this can be also extended to room temperature. And nowadays, uh, we basically, by default, by default, operate at room temperature. Yes, please. So, uh, when you talk about neural nets, uh, mm. you change your weights using, like, backpack propagation? Right. Yeah. How do you change the right. So there is not a one-to-one -one mapping of the neural network model where you can really per node change the weights, right? So here we have um, external voltages that are, like I explained uh, also to, to him just before, effectively they change the, the, the tunneling rates between the individual particles so that the, um, yeah, the trajectories of the, of the current through, through this network changes in a, in a non-trivial way. And so we, you have, for example, that some paths are enhanced, but some are inhibited. And uh, this gives us uh, sufficient complexity to also get uh, uh, XNOR, XOR, and so on. So instead of having... Yeah. And, and we keep it like that. It's trial and error, but it's guided. It's, it's a little bit more sophisticated than trial and error because it's guided by this evolutionary algorithm. So we also did kind of brute force search, and you can really show that uh, this uh, genetic algorithm helps you to find a solution um, more quickly. Um, gradient descent, I'll come back to that in the end of the talk. There is also ways that you can apply that directly to, to material. 
but here we basically use this evolutionary algorithm to find the suitable weights where the uh, weights are not one-to-one -one, the same weights as in the model but kind of more globally uh, Was that a question or there was just a hand voluntarily going? Uh, was that? No? No? Okay. <laughs> Very good. Okay. Uh, how am I doing with time? Terrible, probably. How much is left? 12 minutes left. Okay. I I'll, I'll, will not be able to discuss everything, but uh, I'll uh, give you a glance. Okay. So maybe this, this helps somehow to get uh, an idea of uh, how we envision kind of intuitively what we are doing. So we have this network, we have inputs where we come with a certain problem, for example, recognize this digit, and we manipulate the potential landscape till we get a uh, response, an output that corresponds with a correct label. Yeah. Um, of course, the trick here is now how do you encode an input, such a complicated input like this digit, with a limited amount of electrodes. So there we have still to find tricks. Uh, one of them is simply uh, do, a, do, do time multiplexing, so, so do it sequentially. But what you could also think of is, of course, put more devices uh, in parallel. We are somehow limited by the amount of electrodes that we can put around them, because at some moment uh, they simply get too close and they, they are not really individually affecting the network anymore. And but what we are exploiting is the high nonlinearity, also things like inhibitive uh, behavior, like ne negative differential resistance, which really allows us to do non-trivial operations on the, the data, which you, you wouldn't be able to do with a straightforward uh, resistor network or even uh, more complicated um, uh, circuits. And the philosophy here is now that uh, by solving uh, this problem of the Boolean logic gates, if you, if you would, for example, would like to realize that with uh, traditional components like transistors, you would need at least like something like 12 transistors if you want to do all these flexibility reprogrammable uh, Boolean logic gates. And now you have a system that basically in one shot can uh, solve a problem for you. So we hope that there is something to gain and eh, that there is this parallelism that is uh, provided by all these interactions in your network help you to do these computations finally uh, much more uh, efficiently. Yeah, but that is uh, something to be further um, investigated, whether this really pays off, yeah, because also the downside is that every single device you have to, to train individually. So here you see uh, some results that look very familiar to the ones I showed before for the nanoparticle network but now a Boolean logic for this um, silicon-based uh, device. And if you push it, you can, although it's a bit noisy, you can also get this functionality at room temperature. And as I said, nowadays, we have adjusted our fabrication process such that we can kind of standard work at room temperature. So that's good. So we are away from these crazy low temperatures that we had before. So, yeah, one of the, the, the questions I always get, why on earth do you want to do Boolean logic? Because Boolean logic is this very digital problem, we know how to do it, so why do you come with this fancy stuff to, to, uh, to do Boolean logic? Again, it's, it's, it's a toy problem, it's just a proof of principle, but also um, it shows you that it's especially solving the exclusive OR is an important problem to solve, because in the beginning, of neural network models, uh, the, the fact that perceptrons, the, the simple neurons, could not solve uh, nonlinear problems like XOR was, it was a big party stopper. Eh? They called the first nuclear winter of, of neural network, basically, because people complained that even such, such a fundamental problem could not be solved. So you can also depict the exclusive OR problem as a classification uh, problem. You could ask yourself, can you classify uh, these two classes of red balls and, and blue squares. And you will see there is no linear decision boundary. You cannot draw a line that separates the two. So you have to do something nonlinear like this. And what you could do now is you could first blow up your problem to a higher dimension. So in this case, from 2D to 3D. And if you find an, a nice projection, then you could actually 
uh, solve this problem more easily by finding a linear decision plane in this case. And then you could go back again to, to the first dimension uh, to solve it really easily by, for example, defining the distance as your classifier. So um, it's quite a common practice that if you want to do solve an, a difficult nonlinear uh, classification problem, um, you first blow it up, you try to make it higher dimensional, uh, and after that you apply a simple linear classifier to solve the problem. It looks like a bit counterintuitive, you make your problem first more difficult, but overall uh, you can make your life a little bit more easier. And this step, finding this kind of uh, projection, yeah, this, this is of course the name of the game, but what we argue is that we could use our device for blowing up this, uh, this uh, dimension basically for free, because we have uh, this, this intricate um, interactions and complexity in our material system. So what you see here is, again, schematically the potential landscape of our device. We come in with our XOR problem and by uh, tuning it in the right configuration, it can actually do this, uh, this projection uh, for us. You have a very high dimensional intermediate layer uh, and finally, it, uh, it, it boils down directly to the answer of this XOR gate or nonlinear classification problem, if you like. Um, this is also finding that configuration that solves the XOR is, is again this artificial evolution in this case. Yeah, yeah, correct, correct. So we also applied to another a very famous benchmark uh, in the neural networks. This is this MNIST handwritten digit database. So there's like 10,000s of handwritten digits. And uh, we uh, showed that you can also apply this trick of blowing up the dimension by inserting our device uh, to, to solve this uh, problem. And uh, what we basically do is something that also uh, ha happens in the neocortex uh, of our brain or this cat brain, that you will ha you have certain functionality that is uh, really acting as a feature extractor, which are uh, a couple of neurons that are very sensitive to a certain orientation of, uh, of a feature, like the angle, if it's vertical or horizontal. And only if it has a very specific orientation, you will see that parts, specific parts of the brain will, will get active. And uh, in analogy to that, uh, you can say, well, let's make devices that are very much responsive to a certain input. And because we have a limited amount of inputs, we had to limit ourselves to two by two pixel uh, pictures. And uh, in this example, you see, for example, this only this specific uh, input gives very high output and the other ones are much lower. So we build this in, in the, this problem of solving the MNIST uh, database. And here we scan basically uh, all the inputs by this two by two uh, window. And every time we have this two by two window, we multiply it with 16 of these feature extractors, which are represented by our uh, device. So doing this, this transformation into this higher dimensional uh, world, if you like, is done by the device. And then finally, when we have blown up this space from, uh, from 27 by 27 to something which is 27 times 27 times 16, so you are much, much higher dimensional space, then we come with a, um, a simple linear classifier to assign the labels corresponding to these digit images. So, just to, to illustrate how ugly these, uh, these digits can be, uh, we, in this, this way we could show that we can, can reach 96% accuracy, which is not so meaningful alone, but if you compare to purely linear classifiers, you see that there's really a significant uh, improvement there. So adding this non-linearity could really be very helpful uh, to, to increase classification. If you compare that to state-of-the-art deep neural nets, then you see there is still room for improvement. Yeah, but uh, also what we showed is that in principle, if you 
uh, optimize your, your system, you can get, really go to uh, quite a nice number of operations. This says tera operations per second per, per watt, which is a kind of competitive um, efficiency. All right. Um, I probably have only a few minutes left. So I'll glance uh, another material learning uh, method, uh, maybe also related to, to your uh, question. So, so far we have always doing this, this kind of artificial evolution trick. Uh, but what you could also do, which is a, a little bit of a detour, uh, but an, an interesting intermediate thing to do, is that you have a physical device and based on a lot of input-output data, you can build a traditional neural network uh, based on it. Yeah? So um, what we do here is we have a physical device, we, we give it many, many inputs, and then we measure the outputs, and then based on that we build a neural network model in software. So we, we have a kind of digital clone of, of our physical device. So we learn all these weights, we use this standard backpropagation, gradient descent, and, and so on, to, to come up with a model that uh, talks and walks like our physical device. And now we fix basically the weights and then we say, well, let's now take other learnable parameters and the, the other learnable parameters are the, the configuration. So the, basically the, 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 the control voltages that we normally apply. And um, so we do another learning round and then we come up, if we want, for example, an XOR gate or a NAND gate, we find the corresponding uh, control voltages, but in the model, in the software. And then we obtain these values and then we can go to the actual physical device, we go back to the physical world and we apply these solutions and see if they work. Yeah. And in this way, we can really get nice results like solving this uh, classification problem here where you have two classes, class in the middle and a class in the periphery, and then the device gives a high current if it's class one, let's say of here, here in, the, in, the, in the middle, and uh, a low current if it's in the periphery. So you see the inputs are not zero and one anymore, but they are analog, eh? so you can have all kind of uh, different values. And you also clearly see that this is a nonlinear classification problem, eh? because you need a nonlinear decision boundary here. This is a uh, a problem that is solved in the, in, the, in the model, but then can be fed back to the physical device. And another example is here a device that can basically recognize all 16 different uh, patterns in, for one and the same setting. So we don't need to evolve 16 different feature extractors, but we can immediately recognize uh, whether uh, it's a certain pattern based on uh, 16 different current output levels. So also this kind of more uh, fine tuning can be uh, more easily done if we do this uh, kind of offline learning. Yeah, so you can argue, okay, this is a little bit beyond the point eh, because now you're still uh, using software to solve your problem, but it's true. But please remember that uh, once you have learned it, you can start using this uh, device in the inference, so basically in the operational mode and it can function uh, uh, in, in this way, in a, su a superior uh, way. Let me finish with uh, briefly uh, flashing this idea that you can also do the, the, the traditional idea of backpropagation and gradient uh, descent uh, directly in, in a matter system by applying small perturbations to the inputs and we use uh, a, a technique that is very similar to, to lock-in detection. Um, and we determine basically the gradient uh, for all these uh, different uh, uh, input parameters, which can in principle also be done in parallel. And then based on that gradient information, we uh, update the DC input values of, uh, of the device using an, uh, an error function, so it's still an, an, a supervised learning uh, scheme. Uh, but in principle, this also works, and then we can solve, uh, in this case, also Boolean logic uh, without the need of invoking an, uh, a surrogate model or uh, a genetic algorithm. Yeah, so this, 
this would be really nice if you start to think about online learning and having really an integrated system where you could do this kind of gradient um, evaluation with analog electronics on the, uh, at the edge. Okay, let me uh, very briefly say that here in a collaboration with Münster, we also do physical modeling, uh, which is very important because neural networks are, are basically, uh, there's, no, there's no physics information in these models, right? You basically train them uh, just on input output. Whereas these models are really based on the underlying physics. We make use of Miller-Abrams. We make use of uh, the Coulomb interactions that we have and then solving numerically by, by Monte Carlo simulations, we can find really the trajectories in these uh, dopant network uh, devices and can also show that we can realize functionality. And with these more uh, generic physical models, uh, you can also play with the size of the network, the number of electrodes, the kind of dopants you use. So you can really play with more global parameters. And uh, that's what we, uh, that we work on. And uh, we talked this morning also a little bit about statistics. So th these will be very interesting models also to, to, to look at from a statistic point of view. Okay. Let me stop here. Uh, I hope I give you given you an idea what I mean by material learning, how it's related to machine learning. Yes? Mm -hmm. Sure, yeah. Yeah, so I, I'm, I'm I trying to summarize your uh, question or comment. And so you say, well, the, the, the actual brain is much more complex. There is a combination of electrochemistry and, and hormones and the neurotransmitters and everything. Absolutely true. And so this is really a kind of first performance approach to, to get anywhere uh, close. But of course, with materials, you can also do a lot, right? You can introduce time dependency. You can have dynamic material systems. Uh, we already have worked with uh, examples uh, where ionic transport also plays, plays a role. Uh, so in, in these uh, poly uh, polymer networks, you have both charge and ion transport. So I, I would be the first one to say that indeed, uh, to, to argue that we can copy paste the brain is, is, is outrageous. Uh, if only because we don't even know how the brain works, right? But um, some on an abstract level, I think it's super interesting to try and realize, even in these model systems, some of the generic properties, right? Like parallelism, um, like um, uh, also this, this co-localization of memory and, and processing. And I agree, there's like a huge way to go. But yeah, we have to start somewhere. And, and there is, well, apart from the deep scientific questions, which is super exciting, at least for me, there is also this big issue with energy consumption that I said. So um, although we, we don't know where it's gonna end and if we can solve it, I think there is at least for me enough motivation to, to, to explore this uh, path. Is this somewhat like an answer? Okay, yeah, thanks. Okay, let me wrap up. So, 
We use the intrinsic nonlinear physical properties. We try to exploit them for computation. On the one hand, it's nice. We don't need to design in this case. We are quite uh, robust against defects. The price that we have to pay that every single device has to be trained. And there, is a, there will be a trade-off. In some cases, it may be smart to do. In other cases, it may be very dumb to do. Our motivation is apart from the, as I told you, the, the kind of the scientific motivation also to get to, to systems that have small footprint and, and, and high en energy efficiency so that we can maybe use them for information processing in the future. And with that, uh, thanks a lot for your attention and your nice questions. <laughs>
kind of embody the weight, right? Because we know at least that these synapses can, can uh, get stronger, they can get uh, uh, less stronger, they can get weaker based on uh, specific timing yeah, of, of incoming spikes. So there is a very loose but, but yeah, clear connection between, uh, between that. Um, in our systems, the weights or the kind of individual way uh, to, to, to train these weights uh, is still uh, volatile. So we, we don't have, in this, these examples that I showed you, some, some real synaptic-like behavior inside the material. There's no really plasticity, but there are definitely materials and also examples in literature where, where people exploit this, uh, this um, also non-volatility. Yeah? Uh, Membristors is a very clear example where, where people uh, uh, try to do in-memory uh, computing. Um, yeah, so loosely based, there is definitely this, um, this, this connection between the real physiology of the brain and these neural networks, but it's, it's very, very abstract, right? This is, yeah, so, and, and, and again, everybody who thinks seriously about the brain tells we, we don't, close to nothing about the brain yet, right? Very, maybe very zoomed in, we know some of the details, but especially how the big picture is and how finely uh, things are organized and how thoughts come up, it's still food for your guy, your you guys, your young generation, yeah. Um, thank you very much for this uh, very interesting talk. And, uh, the control voltages that you're applying, are they uh, digital, or do you still use a very them analog fashion? Yeah, that, that's a good then point. So um, they are analog. Of course, there is a limitation of, um, which is very kind of a mundane limitation of the amount of uh, uh, voltage steps we can take. But typically, um, we apply somewhere somewhere between minus one and one volt with steps of one millivolt, for example. So you, you could have like uh, thousands of, uh, of settings there. And yeah. another uh, follow-up question is that uh, the devices that you showed use some uh, specific um, nonlinear elements like the nanoparticles and so on, but right. the actual uh, the field effect transistors that are used in electronics are highly nonlinear in, 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 in principle. Yeah. We just use them in the digital way. Exactly. Right? Yeah. So, they Would are. it be possible to have a network of, of transistors that are controlled by these uh, voltages yeah. and yeah. then they work similarly? I think uh, so, yeah. yeah. That's, that's definitely because, uh, as I think mentioned a couple of times, this, these, these ideas are, are definitely not restricted to these few examples that I showed and, and maybe they are very dumb uh, material systems to work with and there may be better choices. But Indeed, this idea of evolution in matter, it has been done, uh, for example, also with FPGAs uh, and so on. Uh, so it's a very, very, very generic concept. So absolutely, yeah, uh, right. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. We have one more question. Hi, Professor. Uh, I would like to ask, how many neurons does your material have? How many, sorry? Neurons, nodes. Notes. Yeah. Yeah, that's, that's, uh, there, there is, okay, the, the, the physical device has maybe like order 100 particles or a, a order um, 100 uh, dopants in the network. If you ask me now, what is the, uh, to what size neural network would this correspond? We have done some, uh, characterizations like there are uh, like kind of mathematical um, uh, standards that yeah loosely say uh, uh, determine the IQ of uh, of your device they call uh, the VC dimension the Kopnik Chernovskinsky if you think the hard Russian name um, but which basically tells you uh, how many um, how many uh, classification problems with how many nodes it can solve. So we have done these things for our networks and then you could map it on a, a corresponding, corresponding neural, uh, neural network. Uh, so they, 
they are still relatively small, maybe a couple of uh, nodes, I think, what our um, devices would correspond with. But yeah, also there we, we have no final answer yet. I think there also it depends really on the kind of problem you use it for. So our system may be not so good for a certain problem and be relatively stupid, but for another kind of problem, it may be much, much, much better performing. But we try to make this kind of objective mapping on systems that we know. Yeah. Hey, uh, first I would like to thank you for the presentation. I found it quite interesting. Uh, I actually have two questions. The first is, what, what order of temperatures do you need to run those units? And what are their physical dimensions? The, the first question I didn't hear completely. The first question is, uh, what orders of temperature do you need to run the units? And ah, okay. what are their dimensions? Right. OK, so uh, as you saw, we started at really low temperature. It was related to the physics uh, of these uh, Coulomb, Coulomb blockade. So we, we thought that's not, not very, very handy. Uh, then we moved to this um, doping networks that normally operated at uh, 77 Kelvin, eh, so minus 196 degrees C, which is, of course, still not very useful. But we found out that by, by going to the right doping regime and, and, and kind of right biasing, these devices can operate as, as good uh, as well uh, at room temperature with being uh, very, really comparative, uh, comparably smart using the definitions that I just talked, talked about. So yeah, I'm pretty comfortable to say now that we can operate this at room temperature. Dimensions, uh, we typically uh, use a couple of hundred nanometer per, per device and then these electrodes are 50 nanometer uh, wide or, or so, but probably we can we can go even smaller because from from simulations like this Monte Carlo simulations we see that with a very limited amount of dopants or particles you can basically al already get this functionality. So I think we we have an overkill uh, there. All right, and the second question is uh, we know that. Biology does quite well at processing information in neural-like structures. Uh, so the question is, would it be viable to like grow neurons in lab uh -huh. and create some kind of interface uh, to train them and communicate with them? That's or is it more worthy to search for new materials that can imitate that structure? That's a super nice uh, question. Uh, the short answer is, I don't know what is more viable. Uh, of course, if you work with living neurons, I don't know anything at all about it, but the thing that I know about it is that it's very hard to keep them alive uh, for maybe longer than 10 days or so. So um, these, these, these hybrids may, may be the way to go. And, and, and maybe just to turn the question a little bit, one of our dreams is that we can couple our artificial systems to real uh, biological neural networks and then maybe we leave them in place and we have some kind of uh, implant or whatever and instead of having the an implant that always does the same thing maybe we have something that can learn together with these uh, biological ones and they, if they talk in the same language in the same time scales then maybe these are going to be uh, much more um, yeah, valuable implants because they can maybe restore some of the functionality who knows? It's, I mean, for now it's science fiction, but it's definitely something that we dream about and we try to uh, we work on these interfaces uh, also. So that's, that's a fascinating question you're uh, asking. Yeah. Thank you. We have perhaps time for a few more questions. There's one over there. And I think yeah. Uh, first, thank you for the presentation. Thank you. And I would like to ask, do you believe that non-linearity is a major advance in material learning or is the size of the network and the complexity of the connection? Yeah, it's not the only one, but I think it's really a necessary one to have this, uh, this non-linearity. Because as I said, on, on an intuitive level, it's a kind of the, it is a kind of the decider. Eh? So also even in these simplest neural network models, you, you have to build in this non-linear block in order to, to have this kind of, um, 
yeah, decision making. At some moment, you have to to go from zero to one. If you if you uh, project it on the the biological case, then you have also yeah, the uh, the action potential that 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 derives if you are above a certain critical level. So I think nonlinearity is is key, but also um, yeah that you have that you have a network kind of structure that that basically effectively a lot of things can go in uh, in parallel um, and that um, um, well and, and more mundane that you 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 should be a, a, a way to apply inputs you should have outputs you should have a way to to tune which sound trivial but I mean that's also not for every material system so 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 easy um, so I guess it boils down more or less to these ingredients of what we call intelligent matter. That I think this is a kind of the minimum set that you need to 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 do these uh, games that we uh, that we play. Um, and then in extension, what what I've showed today, one of the things that I really really would like to see is the, this this time dynamics, right? So that. Uh, that we can build in different time scales so that you can also really start to play in the time domain uh, which will be also much much closer to actual uh, biology yeah, where the, the brain communicates uh, communicates in, in the time domain and, and um, relative timing of spikes uh, is uh, is key and, and we, we don't exploit that part at all at the moment so I think there is also a lot to gain uh, um, in the visual system, we have a, a really high throughput of information. We have millions of photoreceptors, and this goes to the brain. And how do you think in material learning this will scale up? If you yeah, have? yeah, that's a, that's also a very nice question. We have a, a European project, also with a partner from uh, from Münster where uh, this front end side of, of collecting the, for example, visual, in this case, visual information is done by, by photonics. And because photonics, well, it's super fast, but also you can multiplex. And so you can, you can do wave multiplexing and for this really high throughput, high bandwidth intake of visual data, probably uh, photonic neural nets are, are super, uh, super nice. However, if you then go to next stages where you have to do more uh, fully connected uh, nets and so on, then the problem of photonics is uh, its bulkiness, basically. So then it is probably nicer to work in the uh, electric domain, which is not uh, as fast, and you can't do this multiplexing, but you can, you can much more miniaturize and you can so the, the, there's a trade-off, but we, we are looking at this uh, hybrid platforms, uh, kind of combining the best of, uh, of different worlds. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. I don't know if you've already answered that, but could you chain them, the devices, like the output of one be the input of another and trigger them in chain? Like concatenate them. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. 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 Well, yeah. Um, yes, and, and and we also are looking at that. Uh, the, the problem is that these devices are not as nice as the, for example, the conventional uh, CMOC, CMOS uh, building blocks, because they have gain. And uh, the nice thing about these is that if they have gain, you can fan out and you can make uh, networks. Uh, and these are. Uh, very lousy in that respect. Uh, so what you uh, need to do is, uh, for example, if you have a, a small current output, then you, you first would have to put an IV converter and, and, and amplify, and then you can indeed put it uh, to, uh, to a next uh, network. Um, maybe you remember I, I told you that we can make these surrogate models of, uh, of our devices, so that you make neural network models. And there it's very easy uh, to make multiple uh, uh, network networks. Eh? So you have a kind of nested uh, architecture then. And then we just feed output of one network into inputs or configurations of the others. And there's already papers uh, about that uh, as well. 
And the nice thing is that you uh, can show that uh, these multi multiple network networks get actually smarter uh, according to uh, objective standards. So they can solve more complicated problems. So it's not only that it's uh, like topological that you can have more inputs and more outputs, uh, which is also true, but you can also uh, see that uh, uh, the yeah, complexity of the problems that you can solve with these larger uh, nested networks is also increasing. So that's helpful. But for hardware, we still have to, to work on this issue of how, how we fan out in practice and do this in an, uh, in an economic way. Because yeah, if you have to amplify all the time, then you lose also quite some en uh, energy. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, or, or other things that we, we stay in the voltage domain, which actually also works. Eh? So then instead of current, you, you go from voltage to voltage. We're not, yeah, ideas are welcome uh, there. Uh, yeah. Okay, with that, I think we can end uh, this colloquium. Let's thank Professor Van der Wiel once more. Thanks. Thank you.